1 Corinthians chapter 12, and here in the middle of this lengthy epistle to the Corinthians who had lots of problems, uh, the solution of the gospel is brought forth in a great way when he talks, does the inspired apostle of the body of Christ. And in the first 12 or so verses, the uh, apostle is speaking of the spiritual gifts that God gives. The one spirit gives the many gifts. There's, there's diversities of gifts in the body. And in those verses, he's speaking uh, theologically, uh, the wonderful truth of the blessing of the Spirit and this manifoldness of this blessing of the Spirit and the gifts of the church. Then in verses, uh, well, 12 and following, he presents, as it were, a visual aid. Uh, the apostle may do this in his preaching and writing, present a visual aid and Yours truly is going to do this this morning. He's speaking of something you can see, comparing the dispensations of the Spirit and the gifts of the what God has made of the body, Church of Christ. So this visual aid written down here, we're going to be verse 12 and following to verse 27. And uh, well, let's read through verse 31. As the apostle here is graphic, he's speaking of the spiritual reality of the gifts of the spirit in the, that thing called the church. And now he says, it's just like a body and you are the body of Christ and so on. But so let's read verse 12 and, and following to the end of the chapter. First Corinthians 12, God's word to us today. For as the body is one, that is any body, many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ, that is Christ and his church, his body. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. In fact, the body is not one member, but many. I'm not a hand. I am not of body, is it therefore not of the body? Say, because I am not an eye, not near so important as an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body, just because it says so? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And the obvious answer is no, no, just some. But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way, and that will be 1 Corinthians 13, the way of love. We want to consider in our series of sermons on the church uh, this wonderful 
concept, this doctrine, this truth, this reality of the church as the body of Christ. And we're going to consider, therefore, that concept and truth and doctrine and reality from the perspective of 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually. We want to be considering here also just why we need to hear of the truth of the body of Christ, just how we at Sovereign Grace United Reformed Church are going to be that body in this building. And we want to consider, therefore, what the Holy Spirit would say to us. So I'd point out to you that the Holy Spirit, who has one message, it's always of Christ and of the blessings of God in Christ, nevertheless, points his word at different times and from different perspectives to certain bodies, bodies that need to hear certain things about the truth um, that are particularly what they need to hear at a certain time and situation. So, for example, when the Bible in other places speaks of the church as the body of Christ, there's these different reasons. Uh, one reason, of course, always to know Christ, but different particular reasons why the Holy Spirit inspires the New Testament authors to speak to certain people of the body of Christ. So, for example, to the Romans, Paul writes in response to the great gospel he's brought out of justification by faith alone in chapters 1 through 11 of Romans. He says this in chapter 12, and I'll get to this, the body of Christ here. But first of all, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, because of what I've just said to you, that you present your bodies, plural, individual persons in their body parts, in their whole in their whole makeup, present them a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world in your bodies, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then he says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith for, as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. This sounds like the text to the Corinthians. But to the Romans, Paul is writing about the body so that they may react appropriately with their bodies individually and all together as one church to the gospel of free grace in Christ. Now, there's other texts we could cite out, uh, cite uh, and, and speak to you of the, the thrust of the message, say, for example, in Colossians, where Christ is said to be the head of the body, that he might have in all things the preeminence. But let's focus on Corinth. Corinth was a church that was divided. They had many chiefs, Apostle Paul, and Peter, and, Cephas, uh, and, and Apollos, and so on. And some were even the most pious, apparently, and they said, well, Christ is our all. But the people were divided. They were divided. They were being just like the heathen that had many gods, and they were having many gods in the church. And so Paul writes here in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, and, and in other places here, of the body of Christ that they are, that they might be united. Not all over the place. Not having many gods and many leaders who would pull them that way or that way or maybe to a higher plane because they have this great leader. But he reminds them of Christ who is their all in all and in whom they are one and who has made them one body. So that's the purpose of Corinth here. And our text is really a summary of this whole passage so far with the metaphor of the body. Now, you are the body of Christ and members individually. And we want to consider that then in a kind of a summary way, again, as we consider all these aspects of the church of Christ that we are in this new building, going to be this body of Christ now we, we would bring to you. 
But we want to ask the question, as Sovereign Grace Church, so that the Spirit applies it to us where we need it right now. What is the Spirit speaking to us as members of His body? What's He saying? To us in specific, what do we need to hear as members individually, as all of us together and as leaders of the church, heads of homes, those who may be visiting? What do we all need to hear today? Maybe some of us thinking we're not really that significant in the body. Maybe some thinking we don't really need to join a local congregation. We can be the member of the ethereal body of Christ in, 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 our, in our minds and with our personal relationship to Jesus. What is the Spirit saying to us today and in our time and now in Comstock Park? So let's consider, here we are, the body of Christ. And first of all, we want to consider that we're wonderfully and covenantally made. And I'm speaking there, um, playing off in a, in a godly sense, Psalm 139, which speaks of individual bodies being fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, the body of Christ, the spiritual body of Christ, is, is wonderfully and covenantally made. And then secondly, we want to consider how we show this to the glory of the body of Christ and the glory of Christ, but also, sadly, to our shame in this earth. And then finally, we want to consider our calling and blessing to be and to become the body of Christ. First off, I want to remind you that when the Bible speaks of us being the body of Christ, the Bible is not saying we are Christ or that we are his natural body. No, Christ is in heaven in his body. This is the Reformed faith. He's in heaven in his body. And when he comes again, it will be in that glorified body. And so when he's with us, he's not with us in the body, and he's not here physically present, nor are we the manifestation of his physical presence as his own natural body. Nor, and we should remember this as we partake of the supper, is the text speaking of the sacramental presence of Christ, the real presence of Christ, the spiritual presence of Christ in the supper. We say, this is my body and so on. This is not what the text is speaking of, but it's speaking of the wonderful spiritual unity that Christ has made with himself in his love with his church. And it's called the mystical union. And I know as Reformed believers, firm believers in the Word of God, we aren't those who profess to be mystics who claim to have a relationship with God apart from the Word and the truth of God. We're not here to let go and let God as if we let go of the Word and let God be God, but we are those who are students of the Word and, and so on. But the mystical Union and describing the body of Christ as the mystical body of Christ is a way that we theologians try to show humility. And that is simply by saying, we don't know exactly how this is. That we are the body of Christ. We are like members of the body. And then he's the head. Now, how can that be? That seems like an odd thing. Seems like, and it is, an a wonderful thing, a thing from above. And we say it, and we're bold to say it, because that's what the Bible teaches. And if that's all we can say, that's okay. Because in heaven, we're going to be learning all kinds of things about this mystical union of Christ. But, but there is more than we can say. For example, when Jesus uh, in John, in chapter 14, is speaking of the future outpouring of the Spirit. He says this in John 14, and remember he's in the quiet of the communion that night before he would be, when he was betrayed. He says to his disciples in that, that quiet night, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. And then John 14, verse 20, 
At that day you will know that I am in my Father and this, and you in me, and I in you. That's what the whole truth of the body of Christ is all about. You in me, and I in you. Now, that's about as close as you can get, isn't it, to God, to God, you and me, and I and you. When we think of the body, that's exactly how close we are. Every member of the body, the head and the body, physically connected, but here, spiritually connected. And this, as Jesus will go on to say in a little while, and we will preach of, through the Spirit. Jesus speaks of the other comforter who is going to come, and he will glorify me, John 16, 14, for he will take of what is mine. This is the Spirit's office and work. He takes of what is mine, Christ's, and he declares it to you. He speaks to you in your heart. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. There's that communication of God in Christ, the word of God through the Spirit indwelling. That's something of what the body is all about. I in me and you, I in, you in me and I in you and the Holy Spirit taking of what is Christ's, who has been given of the Father, what is his, and making it ours. Now that's as close as you can come to essential oneness. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the Trinity are essentially one God, but this is as close as you can come without there being an essential oneness. The Bible wants us to come to this understanding. Christ himself does. Just what a wonderful thing God has done in saving us from this world, uniting us to himself. Not superficially, but as a body is joined in the head. And as the communication of the head, the thoughts of the head become the, the mind and the thoughts of the body. And as the blood flows and there's this communication, I don't know, I'm no uh, medical and scientific guy, but as there's this connection uh, hormonally and, and uh, through the nerves and through every, th every sense that the body is connected to the, the, the head and the head to the body. So that's what Jesus is to us and we to him. There's this blood that flows from the one to the other and the other to the one. There's this life that is shared. So the body cannot exist without the head, the church without Christ, nor will Christ exist without the body. Oh, yes, he's God. But he has chosen not to be without this body. Amazing. That is what Paul is driving at, and the Holy Spirit is compelling him to drive at, to bring home to the Corinthians and to us. No matter what now the specific intention, we got to be reminded that this is what God has made in making us a church. And we got to be reminded too, of course, that it's in this church that we are the body of Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. Ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. He's speaking of the Corinthians. He's speaking of the fact that the body of Christ in Corinth that there was a church which is the body of Christ in Corinth, and now he's saying that to us. And Little Farms OPC, or wherever you're from, True Church of Christ, you're the body of Christ. And that's something that a church ought to be remembering 
We are a body of Christ here, locally. All we need here, unless God gives us the increase, and we'll be a bigger body of Christ. But we're not the only ones. There's others who are brothers and sisters and arms and legs and, and intestines and all of these things that are essential for the body of Christ there. And all together, we're this body of Christ, one local place after another. So it's not many bodies. It's one body, but important that it be manifest, as we'll see, in individual places. So that's the first thing. We're fearfully, wonderfully, and covenantally made by the grace of God. And so that we're connected with Christ, our life is in Him, and He in us. Wonderful metaphor, wonderful reality. It's, can we say it's more than a metaphor? It's the origin of the, me- it's the, origin of the truth of the body. It's the, the, the beginning of it is Christ and His body, and then everything else is a metaphor. Everything else is a figure of speech. It's real. It's real. That means, too, we're united to each other. And Paul is all about this in writing to the Corinthians. You are those who are united to each other. You can't say you're not. You can't say, well, I'm a different nationality, I have different color skin, different background. I'm Dutch, I'm Italian, I'm Polish, I'm German, whatever we are. So we're not really connected. No. The apostle reminds us that whether you're Jew or Greek or slave or free, male or female, you're one body. And you're as close as hand is to finger or hand is to foot. And as one is necessary and you don't say, I don't need this or that, so in the body, we're all necessary to the body, even though we might not think so. In fact, if we do think so, I'm not very important, I'm not an eye, I'm just a hand, or I'm just a small intestine, I'm just a kneecap, well, if we say that, I'm not very important, therefore I'm not necessary for the body, we, we lie, we deceive ourselves. The truth is, if we're Christ's, Christ's, that includes are being members of the body, individually members. In particular, the King James has, you are the body of Christ, and each of you take it to heart, you're members. It doesn't feel, matter what you're feeling, even as if you're not feeling well, you have a gut ache, you don't say, well, you know, I'm not feeling like I'm part of the body. No, yes, you really are part of the body, and you, you know it. That, this is the wonder of the Church of Christ. And it's a way we can show off the, the grace of God because that's the third thing I wanted to remind you about this in this as we partake of a supper together. And every moment we have together, we need to be reminded this is a work of God. God joins us to Christ and therefore to God, he joins us to one another, and it's not our choosing. It's God and his mercy, choosing and gracing, giving faith, joining us of his sovereign good pleasure. Over and over again in, in, Corinth, uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, um, it speaks of this being the, the disposition of God, the, the administration, the appointment of God. Verse 28, and God has appointed these in the church. He has appointed these. He has decreed these. And we are, by the grace of God in Christ Jesus, those for whom Jesus suffered. And we are, only by that blood atonement made covenantally one with him and one another, that's the gospel. The gospel of the church's body is the gospel of the broken body, Christ's broken body, and his blood shed for sinners. Believe that? That's the truth. The amazing thing of the body, it's the body of Christ. It comes from Christ and now by His Spirit, all baptized, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13, into one body by the Spirit. So you come to church and you think, I joined the church. Yeah, but God had joined you to His church first 
And all this is so important if we be true to the gospel, true to the, the faith of our fathers living still. This is the beauty of this body of Christ. It's God's work, and it's God's work not only to be preached, but to be lived out of. And this is a second point. The glory of the body and the shame of the body on earth. First, the glory, the good part. The glory of the body is we get to show off the Lord. And that's the one legitimate thing you can show off, beloved, the Lord. Paul says to Galatians, God forbid that I should glory or boast, except in the cross of Jesus Christ by whom I have been crucified to the world and the world to me. I'm going to boast about that double crucifixion, the cross of Christ. The result of it, I'm crucified to the world. It hates me, but I hate the world. The world is crucified to me. There's a distinction. And the Corinthians had every reason to boast in that and to glory in that, and yet they were, they were, they were losing it. Paul reminds them in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 12, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. I want you to know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. You were that. You were joined to the world at the hip under the federation of Adam. You were in Adam. Adamites. You were that. You were Corinthians. Corinthianizers. That was the byword of the day. As sexually immoral as the rest, as idolatrous as the rest. And therefore hopelessly disunited. And they were bringing that disunity into the church. They had other gods, Peter, Paul, Apollos. They even made an idol of Christ as if he were one of many. Paul says, no, this is not who you are. Not who you are because this is what you are, the body of Christ Jesus. You're all about the blood of the Lamb, and the Holy Spirit. And you're all about this heavenly kingdom and this heavenly life and this unity. Because of this, I want to remind you to be that body on this earth. So, for example, in our suffering with one another, Paul speaks of this. Our suffering with one another, or when... Others suffer. Verse 26, if one member suffers, all the member suffers. That ought to be shown. And you think about that. That's called empathy. If one member of the body suffers, the whole members, the whole body suffers. Now think of, here's a visual aid. Think of when you're sick. Well, I'll remind you of what happened to me when I had knee surgeries the past couple of years. My knee was in pain, and after surgery was in pain. Now, some of you are tougher than I, and you, you don't have that pain, but I had a lot of pain. And I didn't let my knee suffer all alone. I suffered. So the knee, I couldn't say, the knee, you go ahead over there, I'm going to go to sleep. I stayed up all night with my knee, my painful knee. And twice, I thought I'd learn not to do this again, uh, but I got two knees in two years. And my whole family suffered because I wasn't getting any sleep and you become this grumpy sort of you, this kind of self-centered sort of you in your pain and misery, but all because the knee was the problem. Pain medicine didn't help either. But how affected I was and we are in little things, we think, when you get a thorn in your flesh. 
You're just obsessed with it sometimes. You can't do your work. They say even if, if both your big toes are cut off, you can't even stand. Think of that. Again, if your intestines are all messed up, you're messed up. Your back hurts. You become depressed. Fearfully and wonderfully made our bodies, but here is something for us to think about spiritually as the body of Christ. When one member suffers, maybe the loss of a loved one, we all suffer. We all hurt. And in a way, you don't even have to try because it's the reality. And yet we're so foolish and insensitive, we, we need to remember this, to pray about this, and to be that people of God together. We're sensitive to one another. And so when one member rejoices, we're to be glad for the others. Got a job, got a new home, got a, got a godly mate. You're glad for the others. So the body of Christ shows off the virtues of Christ, which is esteeming each other highly, and it's the exact opposite of envy. We don't envy one another. We love one another. We're glad in each other's successes. We're glad that they got a race. We're glad that this and that and the other thing. We're glad that that person can speak, and, and maybe I can't speak, but I can hear, and I'm glad for what he says because we're glad together in Jesus and we want to hear the voice of Jesus. And that makes us happy, blessed, and fruitful. That's another thing and essential thing about this being this church to the glory of God. We speak his word here. We live out of his truth. If we don't have that, we don't have anything distinctive here in Comstock Park. And the building is just the building, whether it's this this church or that denomination or whether Alcoholics Anonymous meets here or whatever. We're just a group with some vague and fuzzy God, not the God of the Bible, and this people that may have just started up because there's some young youngster out of seminary and he's got some great ideas and he's got a lot of hype and so on, and, but we've forgotten the faith of our fathers. Beloved, here we are, preaching the ancient of days, the old gospel, and wanting it. That's what makes us live as the body, the truth as it is in Jesus. And godly elders who administer church discipline that way, and we're careful that there be no schism in the body. You know what it is in the body when one of the body parts or is affected by something, one of the body parts, just feeds on itself and grows in itself. You know what we call that when a body part does that? It doesn't care for the rest of the body, but we call it cancer. That's cancer. So that's not good. You've got to get the cancer out. The body of Christ, just because we're members of a church building and so on and an outward church doesn't mean that every member of the church visibly is a member internally and in the soul, so there must be this discipline so that there's no cancer in the body, no cancer, no leaven, no ungodliness. Well, this brings on body shaming. You know the, the whole new thing. You can't be body shamed. If anybody says you're obese, <gasps> You're body shaming me. People have no sense of the beauty of Christ and the beautiful body that Christ makes in the soul. But the world, when it sees us showing off the glories of Jesus, hates that. Understand that? They hate you as a member of that body, they hate the church as it stands for Christ, the head of the body. They can't stand it. Because of Christ, that's the point. Christ is all 
The body is his to use in his service, and wherever that body is actually thriving and not hurting in the sense that it's compromised, there Christ is in the midst, and people don't like the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus of the church, and they'd crucify him afresh, and they'd say, well, that church in Comstock Park is judgmental. They actually preach against homosexuality. They actually preach against this terrible movement of uh, the, the criticism of, of culture and everything else that they're criticizing today, finding they, they think some boogeyman somewhere who's the cause of all the bad in this culture. They hate when Christ in all of his glory and his exclusiveness is preached, and it reminds them of sin. They hate that. They cannot stand when we show off the virtues of Christ. They call us a bunch of losers, so they shame us when we stand out. Ingloriously, they also shame us and mock us and when we fail to our shame when we're a bunch of hypocrites. When the guy in the pulpit is all about the guy in the pulpit and not about Jesus. When the elders tyrannize the church, the deacons, they want more social justice than God's justice. When the heads of home, they're just dissatisfied because of this and that and the other thing. They don't like the paint on the wall. When they lead their children astray, also in not loving their wives or the wives loving their husbands. That's to our shame. When, as the Corinthians, we become disunited over this and that and the other thing, again, a temptation for us. We just have this body. We are this body, and now we have this building. All with this comes all kinds of blessings, but all kinds of temptations. We don't feel... Now we're in, we're part of it, we can't do all of this stuff, we don't know how we fit and so on. And we have great opinions, very strong opinions about the color of this and the, the, the whatever. What would the Spirit have us hear of the truth of the body? That we not be shameful here, fighting and bickering, but that we be one as we have been by the grace of God. What would the Spirit be saying to us so that we could be thankful, full of thanks every single day here? And when we go home at work and play, in all our pursuits, even when we would go to the house of mourning. That leads to this, our calling, our blessing and our calling to be and to become the body of Christ. Final point. The first thing that we need to remember here to avoid the shame, to give God all the glory in this church as the body of Christ is this. Let's be one with Christ. That's the first thing. I think a lot of problems come when members of the body, they ask themselves the question, how do I fit in? How do I fit in here? And I'm not fitting in. Nobody likes me. They must be talking about me. And I, I, can't, I can't speak and I... You know, I can't do this and that. And I want to commend to your attention, that's the wrong first question to ask. I say this to married people, people marrying. Remember, your relationship with one another depends on your relationship with God. So each of you have a personal relationship with Jesus. Pray much, draw near to God on your own. That will be your togetherness. Same thing in the body of Christ. Don't ask, you know how you can serve the church and how you can be this and that and, and whatever, but first, how you can serve Christ. How are you a member of Christ? How are we individually? We are members individually of Christ, personally. Nobody takes that responsibility for you. You are this responsible Christian, this graced Christian, if you truly be Christ's. Draw near, grow, and then you see all the answers, how you fit in, what kind of a, a mate you want, what's the next thing you can do for Christ in his church, they'll be answered. That's not just experience, that's the truth of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. 
And you'll find just your niche. It's amazing to me all the niches in, in the economy, this capitalistic economy, at least it has been. The places people find how to make money and, and how to serve this, and, and, and that's calling. But in the Church of Christ, it's the same thing. You find your niche. It might be a little niche. It might be a talent you have that nobody really has. Maybe an insight you have at a meeting, at a Bible study. Maybe a gift of prayer and intensity that, that is so blessed and nobody knows about it. Maybe you write a note. Maybe this or that. You know, God knows his place for you in the kingdom. Think about it. And we have many, many people here with many, many talents, all kinds of jobs, comparatively, relatively. And God will bless us. Do that. Then find how you're useful, how you can be useful. You find your place in Christ and in the body, and you find how you can be useful. And then don't ever question the wisdom of God. Don't do that. God is good to put you in a local congregation. Be there, be content, be happy. Be someone who is truly growing in the word here, and you will find that God will be with you, beloved. That's what he wants to say to us today as we begin our life in a, in a building where his body, and he gave his son's body to be broken for you, and now live out of the fullness of Christ crucified and risen and coming again to take his body home, to raise his body to the glorious place called heaven, in the heavenly body of Christ. Amen.